a quick little primer before we start, because it has been a bit. I apologize. Stuff comes up every time I try to record something like this. These videos take a little longer to make, and I have a job and a life that take priority, sadly. One day, if this channel makes enough money that I can spend more time on it, I would pump out longer content like this. So, as another reminder, this iceberg is something I've put together. I've also used other icebergs as inspiration without actually taking them the whole hog. Uh, here's the people that I've directly sourced mine from. Check out their original iceberg images, but we're still going through mine and just jump right into it. With this, we're on tier two. Tier two is the little deeper concepts, as in these are general overview concepts and events and things you need to understand to start delving into 40K further. Basically, if you go into any decent overview video, these are the stuff that are actually gonna be discussed and primed for you. Which first we have the Emperor of Man, who is a very important figure. <laughs> Honestly, probably the most important figure in 40K, as he is the Emperor of Mankind, the leader of humanity, who now sits on his golden throne as a skeleton rotting away in the corpse of the empire he helped build. Long ass time ago, he came out of the shadows to bring humanity out of its dark ages and led it on a crusade against all of the galaxy, where he spread the knowledge of the imperial truth, God, superstition, religion, cringe, all science and reason under his banner. And then it toppled because his kids, which I'll get into in just a second here, a good chunk of them, about half, turned traitor in a pretty big event known as the Horus Heresy, and now, He's a skeleton, and a skeleton that is now revered as a god sitting on a golden throne, which the golden throne is a psychic amplifier, which he uses to light what is known as the Astronomicon, which is the only way humanity can navigate space. Essentially serving as a giant north star in space so people can actually navigate in relation to Earth or Terra as it's called. And also the emperor to stay in the weird perpetual life state requires the souls of a thousand psychers to be sacrificed every day. However, it is important to note with this, this number is increasing with future books as they come out. The tech in that golden throne, it's wearing out. There are some very recent events that especially talk about that this throne is going to be gone probably in like a thousand years or so. So keeping it together is pretty important and keeping the emperor alive is pretty important. So the number most recently that I saw was, it's now 4,000 Psyker souls a day. These are the Primarchs, his genetically created children, since the Emperor had to make his own perfect generals to lead his armies during the Great Crusade, to where he created 20 of them, two of them went a little missing, and all of them having their own set of skills, powers, DNA, genetic information that they then brought to the table, all to lead these special legions of space marines. And each one of them is a full on character with a lot of either interesting or annoying qualities, depending on who you talk to, which these guys is, should be stated, are goofy strong when it comes to 40K. Power scaling is a very interesting concept here. And Primarchs, oh man, they are capable of some ridiculous feats and have access to some insane powers. We have shit like a uh, future sight, the ability to erase yourself from perception, the ability to go invisible. Those are separate abilities. <laughs> Being incredible craftsmen who also has metal arms. And the list goes on and on and on. And now each one of these Primarchs is in a differing state of either prevalence, existence, or life. As a good chunk of them died, <laughs> ran off, and haven't been seen since, or have recently returned, be they you know, on the side of the Imperium trying to lead it from the ashes or demons that are trying to destroy it. The warp is the Immaterium. It is a different dimension that is the method of faster than light travel in 40K, where imagine you're trying to go through space and it's the typical like this level of faster than light travel, every single sci-fi universe has to touch on their own individual method of doing this. In 40K and in many other universes, they have wormholes where they punch through reality into a different dimension, pop out much faster than it would have been to go, you know, in real space. And here, imagine this dimension is just hell. You are going through a horrific biblical hell. It, it's pretty rough. It's the inhabitants of demons. It's the inhabitants of the chaos gods. 
deeper, darker entities that are pretty still unknown. The realm of chaos where space and time, those concepts, novelties, absolute jokes when it comes to it. Pure suggestions. What are you talking about, physics? Nah, man. Nah, it's the warp. We do whatever we want here. With the term heresy, this is relating to two very separate concepts, one in-universe and one out-of-universe. For the in-universe, the Imperium of 40k is a very dogmatic, authoritarian, pretty shitty government system where the method of control is ideological control of curbing literally any possible dissent. And the method they do this is any slight thing that they can classify as treason or going against the Imperium in any way gets the big fat red rubber stamp of heresy and the sentence for heresy is death. <laughs> Many times summary execution. This can be from, you know, legitimate things of shit talking the emperor, the god of humanity, really just shitting on his name, legitimate heresy by the definition, or like you didn't finish your plate of rations and you like tossed them away or you gave your kids some extra ration. That's going against what those rations were made for, the holy purpose of them, heresy, shot in the head. Or maybe you looked at a government official just a little, little too long. Maybe your expression wasn't very nice or you made eye contact on accident. Absolute heresy, die. And then there's the other version where the out of universe thing, where heresy is an ongoing meme that you slap on everything and it's painfully unfunny, but it's a rite of passage for any community. There's always a community meme that gets spread around, largely by people who are new to the hobby. They think it's hilarious. It's not, <laughs> I'm sorry. And we also got ab humans. Ab humans are essentially like little sub races of people, mainly mutations that are very common and then codified into a specific group. They come in many different sizes, many different shapes. We have some very familiar ones. The two most familiar ones, honestly, is gonna be the Ogrens, which are big, kinda of dumb, but absolutely like sweet and very loyal. Uh, there is some stories you can read that are fucking really sad <laughs> when it comes to them. Uh, they're great. Everyone loves the Ogrens. You also have the Ratlings, which are just like, they're really horny halflings. I'm not joking about that. They're also great snipers and not related to the Skaven. I'm sorry, fantasy fans. Other than that, there's some other little tidbits like the fact uh, Beastmen, as in, in fantasy, actually exist in Warhammer. They are an ab human species. There's also things like Felonids, which are cat people, but not in the way you're hoping. Weebs, not in that aspect. A little different, probably. There's no art of them. But yeah, there's like a bunch and most of them don't have art, so I can't reference a bunch with visual aids here. The old ones are one of the first things you will learn about if you start trying to learn the timeline of 40K. The old ones are the first sentient species that existed in our galaxy, where they were like pretty strong psychic toad men that didn't turn into astral projections of toad men. These dudes were pretty, pretty cool in all accounts, pretty chill people and they also really enjoyed uplifting other species and uplifting life. And in fact, they actually set the, uh, the little starting bits of humanity. They're the cause of humanity uprising to the species they would later become in 40K. And as well, they did the funny goofy little thing of denying one race known as the Necron Tear, that name should be a little familiar, uh, and denied them the gift of immortality and power and the method of curing their pretty bad space cancer. Something that I am certain would not bite them in the ass later. And yeah, I kinda did with the emergence of the Catan. The Catan are the star gods of the Necron tier. The Catan are the star gods. The Necron tier found and then built bodies for to find a method of getting both immortality, curing themselves, and getting back at those fucking frogmen for denying them all those rights to immortality. But these Catan came in very different shapes and sizes. We have a few interesting ones, like the Void Dragon, the Nightbringer, the Deceiver, who's very important, is the Deceiver is the one who made the deal with the leader of the Necrons at the time, the Silent King, to give up their bodies and have the Necrons here turn into what is now the Necrons of cool robot bodies, but their souls got eaten by the Catan because they eat souls now. Though, uh, after this next event I'm gonna talk about, the Catan are still in 40K, but they were all shattered by the backstabbing of the Silent King, to where now the Catan are in shards, where they're much more easily controllable. Where basically now they're kind of used like Pokemon or generators. 
you can throw one out to go deal with some of your enemies, or you have a cool machine you got a power, just slap one of these dudes in it. He's he doesn't have a choice. What's he? Well, this is a being of infinite solar energy. Whatever. In that specific event where the old ones would kind of regret their actions. The War in Heaven. The War in Heaven is the war between the Necrons, where the Old Ones rapidly uplifted a bunch of races. Mainly, the Orcs and the Eldar to help fight against the Necron, which then uh, both of them kind of <laughs> forgot and did their own thing down the line, and the Old Ones all got killed. All dead by the Catan, and right at the end of the War in Heaven is when the Silent King struck against the Catan, shattered them, and imprisoned them. And also, a really important byproduct of the War in Heaven is two parts. First, the Eldar were now the dominant race in the galaxy where they would expand their empire and f start fucking a lot. That's important, I'll get to that later. And the second aspect is the warp started to churn. It was a little more docile back in the day, back in the nice days where the warp essentially just had like a couple places where you just shouldn't go, like just avoid these little spots and you'll be fine. It started to churn with all the psychic energy of people dying in war and all the things that brings. The Horus Heresy is a very important event in the timeline of 40k and in the Imperium's history. This is set 30,000 years or so right before where 40k takes place. This is the giant civil war caused by the Primarchs, half of them going traitor, half of them staying on the side of the Imperium and fighting each other. And as well is a giant book series. Look at all these books. This flowchart is so goofy. I love this thing. If you really want to read the Horus Heresy, it's all in here. It is a lot. It is too much for me to detail in short blurbs. Essentially, this is the spot where the Emperor got thrown, and all the Primarchs either went missing, died, or erased from existence, like the instigator Horus did, uh, who died so hard that the Emperor literally erased his soul from existence. The Dark Age of Humanity is also known as the Golden Age of Humanity. It's referred to as the Dark Age because, uh, oh boy, there's some spooky shit that comes from this era. Though, don't let the name fool you, this is actually a pretty positive time in the grand aspect of human history in 40k, set mainly in the 15th to the 25th millennium. This is the point where humanity ascended to the stars and really started to go ham. They colonized a fuck ton of places. I'm talking like so many spots. And as well, the Dark Age of Humanity is the point where humanity had so much scary tech. It is horrifying, th this level of bullshit they could do. This level of tech is like magic. It is scary, it's really major, to the point where even the Mechanicus, who love knowledge and discovering this tech, when they discover some of this, they're like, nah, put it back. Just keep it hidden, we, this is too much. The birth of Slanesh was a very cataclysmic event in this timeline, as this was at the point where the Eldar were having real, real issue with their society. They became incredibly hedonistic, mainly in the fact that Eldar require a bit more, a bit more things to get those emotions flowing, get that dopamine rushing in their brains. You know, alien physiology, it's not the exact same as ours. They're a little more resilient to emotional stuff than humans are. So it takes more stimulus to get them to where they wanna be. And when they're in a period in their history where there's literally like nothing to worry about, they're in prosperity, things are pretty good, there's no other really alien species out there that are gonna fuck with them. What are they doing? They start to really uh, stay in their own shit, get a little more hedonistic, and it turns slowly from just regular, say for example, regular fucking. Then it turns to like, yeah, you know, you need some ropes and stuff. And then it turns to the point of, you need to stab somebody in the throat to nut. Uh, pretty rough. It also wasn't just sex. There's a lot more that it comes to. Anything in excess was the main point. And the Eldar being a very psychically potent species and a very big species with a lot of them doing this, did this so much that they created the Chaos God Slanesh, the Chaos God of excess, hedonism, anything taken to its extremes. It's bad. The birth of a Chaos God did a couple things. It created a giant rift in real space known as the Eye of Terror. This is an entry point to the warp itself from space without any fancy use of tech. It's also a place where demons and shit can get out of. Also, Slanesh uh, claimed every single Eldar soul. All of the Eldar that were not in special circumstances at the time were immediately yoinked by Slanesh and are currently being tortured for all existence for their amusement because uh, that's their birthright. It's pretty rough. Also, this threw the warp into such fucking disarray 
that the humans had what was known as the Age of Strife, where they were completely cut off from each other. Warp travel and warp communication was impossible. So a lot of places died. This event of the Age of Strife is what brought the Emperor of Mankind to come out of hiding and get something done, as humanity was at its lowest and most likely going to just die out if he didn't. Psychers, I mentioned this earlier, but psychers are essentially space wizards. That's, there's more complexity to it, obviously, but they essentially just, they can do magic, but it's psychic ability, it's not mana and all that. But picture this, picture you're a cool mage and you throw a fireball. They, like you roll one, ah damn, I missed. Instead of like just missing, your head explodes and a demon comes out. Shit like that it is very dangerous because psychers are actually tapped in through some genetic thing, some species thing. There's multiple reasons for different groups having this. In humanity, it is a genetic mutation that was brought on by Slash's birth when the warp got really fucked up. This is the point where psychers really started popping up in many different people and many different planets. But psychers tap directly into the warp, shape it to their will, and manifest it. So a lot of them can do some pretty goofy things. There are actually like basically spell disciplines, like psychic stuff. You can learn like pyromancy shit, sanctic disciplines, even like language spells, like stuff like that. Which also, I use the word spell here. It's not literally like book learning to learn a spell. It is reality warping more in its aspect. You just usually have some form of style that you really find yourself more naturally attuned with. And as well, uh, psychers are hated. Very hated, because during the Age of Strife, when these psychers start popping up, first people are like, ah, oh, hell yeah, mages are real. That's cool, that's neat. And then demons started coming in, because uh, a psyker, especially an untrained psyker, is like a nice little beacon in the warp to where these predators can come through, manipulate, use them to pop out of real space and start going havoc. So the places that didn't do uh, psyker culls and like kill off all of them in witch hunts, a lot of those places died because they didn't manage their psyker population. Which is rough, but this is what leads to the pretty nasty temperament in the Imperium. The Fall of Cadia is a very important point in 40k, as this is the point where it actually started to progress the timeline. It's a very big running joke that 40k was staying at the star date of M41999, and it was just staying there perpetually. The Fall of Cadia is where it shifted over to M42, where we are currently. Cadia is the planet that was basically holding the fucking line against the Eye of Terror from coming out any further into Imperium space. Cadia being a pretty strong fortress world where everybody was trained in military. Of the Guardsmen Regiment, they are the biggest. It's also a big claim to fame is the fact that Cadia broke before the Guard did. The Guard held the line till the very end. Though Abaddon the Despoiler, he threw a tantrum, crashed his big funny doomsday weapon into the planet, cracked it, destroying the protective pylons that existed on Cadia, and allowed the Eye of Terror to zip its way through the galaxy to where now it is split into rough shit, you know? <laughs> Which then directly following this event is the revival of Gilliman, where Rebute Gilliman, the Primarch of the Ultramarines, one of the Emperor's more loyal sons, was able to be revived through the efforts of a lot of people, mainly Belisarius Call, the Eldar Yvrain, leader of the Yanari faction of the Eldar, a bunch of Black Templars, some Ultramarine, it was a whole event. But they were able to uh, revive him after he was put into a uh, good old life support stasis because he was poisoned and they couldn't really cure it. But don't worry, he's kind of better in the fact that he has armor that perpetually regenerates him from a spooky chaos poison and he can't take the armor off or he'll die. Where now he leads the Imperium in a pretty dark age where he has to look out at the universe and see the, every single thing his dad built up uh, completely subverted and fucked up. Which is not a fun feeling. Uh, Post-Revival Gilliman is actually a very fun character. You'll see a lot of shit talk, a lot of shit thrown at Gilliman. Post-Revival Gilliman is great. He is such a fun character. Imperium Nihilus is what is considered uh, the other half of the Imperium. As we have like the main side of the Imperium where Terra is on, the other half is a little rough. Imperium Nihilus is currently held and mainly led by one Commander Dante. At least he's not the like, direct leader. He's more of the guy that organizes the defense of it. He's in charge. It's not the greatest job for him. Commander Dante, renowned of please, oh God, let me die, where Sanguinius 
the Primarch of the Blood Angels, won't let him die. Oh, poor man. <laughs> but Imperium Nihilus is pretty fucked up in the fact that communication with like your main hub and resources are a little hard to come by and the shit over there gets a little spookier. It takes longer for reinforcements. It's bad. It's not a great time. But you'll also see a lot of stuff starting to take place in Imperium Nihilus as, you know, it's more fun to tell the stories from the people who are actively in the worst situation of their lives. And yeah, that's part two. Uh, part three will come hopefully soon. I'll do my best. I hope to get it done next week. So, uh, see ya.